I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Before the proverbial ink was even dry on the Iranian nuclear deal signed in 2015, Iran has pushed its limits. Slow but consistent breaching of the limitations that Iran took upon itself when it signed the JCPOA in the summer of 2015. Now, it's doing it step by step. While misbehavior like that led President Trump to pull out of the international agreement, Iran's tactics seem to be working. The most recent report of the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency discovered Iran now has 12 times the amount of low enriched uranium allowed by the so-called deal. According to the Institute for Science and International Security, Iran's estimated breakout time as of late September 2020 is as short as three and a half months. That time frame would be early 2021, but that element is just the first of two steps towards a nuclear weapon. The other point is how to assemble a nuclear device. It's not the same how you um, create the device to start the nuclear uh, Reaction. That makes the major question, how long would it take for Iran to have a nuclear bomb? I would say that if Iran decides that it puts away all kind of international respect and oversight considerations and, and go fast forward, then Iran can become nuclear, fully nuclear, meaning with the ability to put a bomb on a missile, etc., between three and five years. Well, tonight I'm here to tell you one thing. Iran lied. In April 2018, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went on prime time to unveil thousands of documents taken straight from Iran's secret atomic archives. What we found in the archives is a good answer to all those who said, nah, the Iranians are not serious. The archive gave us a clear picture of very serious project, which was very much advanced. For Israel, the question of a nuclear Iran remains a daily exercise. Our philosophy is very clear. We are getting every morning, we ask ourselves, will tomorrow will be too late? If the answer is no, we are going for another day. And when the minute will come, if the minute will come, and we will have to answer ourselves, yes, tomorrow will be too late, then we will have to ask ourselves, okay, what we are doing. It's clear after facing the potential of a nuclear Iran, Israel has been preparing to answer that question for a long time. Well, Chris is with us now from Jerusalem. Chris, there was a report in the Jerusalem Post that uh, Netanyahu has met with the leaders of the ITF, and they literally are, are planning a strike against those uh, uh, Iranian nuclear, uh, wherever they, ha they have their, their uh, uranium. Uh, do you have any uh, update on that? Well, that's a speculation here right now, Pat, that there would be a possible window, and this happened again in 2008, you may remember, between the uh, election of President uh, Barack Obama and, and, uh, and George Bush that had to leave, and there was a window, they felt, between the election and the inauguration. Now, right now, as we just saw, the election is quite in doubt, but there is a possibility, the speculation that they could attack. Now, an attack like that, Pat, would be very, very challenging. You know, you have multiple sites all over Iran, 
Iran. They learned from what happened in 2007 and 1981 when Israel took out Iraq's nuclear program and Syria's nuclear program. So right now, those, those spread, their nuclear facilities are spread all over Iran. Many of them are underground. So there remains to be seen whether or not they actually will take the initiative to do that. We know, Pat, from, uh, from information that in 2012, then Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu wanted to attack, but his cabinet wouldn't let him. And, but we see from those archives that were discovered by the Mossad back in 2018 that, uh, that they had really progressed substantially on a nuclear program, not just uh, enriching uranium, but also trying to develop a nuclear warhead. Uh, Chris, the North Koreans apparently have nuclear weapons, and they wouldn't hesitate to share that technology with Iran. Has any of that taken place? Well, I'm sure there's three countries right now, Pat, that are sharing information with Iran. That would be North Korea, as you said, Russia, and China. And so, you know, and there is speculation. In fact, there was a, 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 a geopolitical thriller by our friend Joel Rosenberg that said North Korea was going to transfer some of its nuclear weapons uh, to Iran. And so that would be one way that Iran could get a nuclear weapon. But, you know, there's a lot of happening right now, Pat, and especially this report is very troubling about the fact that they have have 12 times the amount of enriched uranium. Right now, it's about 3.5%. Now, the, to get to weapons grade, you have to go to 90%, but because of the physics, it really doesn't take that long. That's why they say about three and a half months, they can have enough enriched uranium to have a nuclear bomb. The question is, whether or not they have a nuclear device to put on it. And one last thing, Pat, that people really need to know about is the fact that Iran has a robust, impressive ballistic missile system that can, uh, that can deliver a nuclear warhead. And now they have, they're very precise, and now they have what they call a missile train where they can fire a multiple ballistic missiles at one time. And even Israel, with probably the, with the world's best anti-missile system, may not be able to uh, hit all those incoming missiles. Uh, Chris, you know, I'm a believer in the Bible prophecy, and in Ezekiel, there's discussion of a uh, Gog and Magog, which would be Turkey, joining with Persia, which of course is Iran, uh, to move against Israel. And uh, he doesn't say anything about nuclear, he just says a huge force. But what do you think? I mean, is the possibility during this interregnum, if I can use that term in the United States, that, that uh, uh, Erdogan, who thinks himself the new uh, caliphate, he, he may join with Iran to, to move against Israel? Uh, it's a possibility, Pat, whether or not it would have in this interregnum, as you said. But I, we have a story coming up on Thursday, you'll be glad to know, about Turkey. And we have an expert saying that Turkey and Iran are really on the same page. They are different in their Islam. One is Sunni, the other is Shiite. But really, they both have the same ambitions. And one of those ambitions is to come and take over Jerusalem and destroy the Jewish state. So, uh, so there is a co coordination, a collaboration between, at least in their ideologies. And uh, very well, because of what Ezekiel said, we could see that kind of alliance uh, you know, coming to fruition in the near future. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, 
stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Central America is facing its second major hurricane in as many weeks. This is Nicaragua as Hurricane Iota approached landfall. A storm surge of up to six meters and winds of 250 kilometers an hour battered northern beaches. This is the fifth hurricane I've seen in my life, and it's one of the strongest and most destructive hurricanes we've ever seen. Iota made landfall in Nicaragua just 25 kilometers from where Hurricane Ita struck two weeks ago. It killed more than 120 people. Residents traumatized by Ita fled again. 
We are asking people to help us take our things to another place. Please, we are asking them to take us to where it's safe because it's not safe here. I'm afraid for my life. Iota crossed the Caribbean as a Category 5 hurricane. It's the strongest storm ever recorded in the Atlantic this late in the year. Records began in 1851. Iota first pushed over the Colombian islands of San Andres and Providencia. It's the most powerful storm to ever hit Colombian territory. The devastation there is immense. There is maximum damage to the infrastructure. We're talking about 98% of the infrastructure on the island of Providencia being ruined. IOTA is expected to move next to Honduras and Guatemala, soaking the already sodden track of Hurricane Eta. Their presidents joined forces to ask for financial aid, with the economic forecast just as dire. It has been scientifically verified and seeing it in practice that Central America and Honduras are among the regions in the world most affected by climate change. We have a problem. Countries know that due to their industries, that they are the greatest generators of climate change effects, so they have green funds available. But it's extremely difficult for us to access the funding. The 2020 Atlantic hurricane season has seen the most named storms on record, so many that meteorologists ran out of names from their set list. People across Central America are hopeful IOTA is the last one of the year. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. People here in Alcala say they are burying a hero. Neri Abalos died while rescuing his neighbors from flood waters using his own boat. But his daughter Angela is angry and is calling for justice. She says her father didn't have to die from electrocution if only power lines were disconnected early enough while Typhoon Vamco was hitting the entire Philippine region of Luzon. Justice. Justice. Where was the village captain? Where was the police? My father wasn't any of those, but why did it have to be him to rescue the residents? None of them showed up. They found his body two days later. Typhoon Vamco was not meant to be this devastating. Now, days after the typhoon struck, the government is facing widespread criticism from people here. They say the tragedy could have been contained with more able leadership. 
Cagayan was not even under a typhoon warning when Vamco hit the capital region. It was only experiencing monsoon rains at the time. More than 80,000 people had to be rescued in this town alone. Widespread deforestation has long been blamed for constant flooding here too. Makeshift shelters like this one are now visible along the highways of Alcala and nearby towns. Civilians who have lost nearly everything and are in desperate need of aid. Inside this small tent, there are five families who have to endure nights sleeping on the ground with their children. Our house is still under water, so we just have to stay here and cramp under this tent. We're grateful for any help. They once had rice fields and comfortable homes. Now this is all they have left. Typhoon Vamco only hit the region of Luzon for a few hours, but it left a trail of destruction and suffering. Jamal Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Cagayan Province, Northern Philippines. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word, Shabbat, which means, literally, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons. For punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. We begin with the conflict in Ethiopia, where government forces say they've captured a town in the northern state of Tigray. Government officials accuse local Tigray forces of taking 10,000 prisoners from the town of Alamata as they fled. There was no immediate comment from Tigray's leaders. Meanwhile, Tigray's regional president has accused the neighbouring country of Eritrea of sending tanks and troops into his region. He says Eritrea is supporting the Ethiopian government's offensive. Eritrea has denied that and accused Tigray of firing rockets at two of its airports. So the war in the north between the Ethiopian National Defence Force and the Tigray Regional State Special Force in Malaysia has continued for yet another day. This is a really a serious situation at the moment and the war has been almost two weeks now since it started. Um, the, the Prime Minister of the country, Abi Ahmed, has said that this is a mission uh, to bring uh, law and order back to that regional state. As you know, Ethiopia is a federal state and the central government is calling the northern tip of the country, the Tigray region state, has a, a rogue state and its leadership is not really complying with the constitution of the country. And uh, besides that, they've been staging attacks, uh, the latest one against the National Defense Force. Prime Minister is uh, serious about uh, finishing the job as soon as possible. But uh, unfortunately, there are a number of people who are being evicted from their homes and uh, they are crossing the border to neighboring Sudan. Uh, and Sudanese authorities, the United Nations, have reported that uh, uh, the number of refugees is in the thousands and this could also increase in the coming few days as a war has uh, continued. On the other hand, the National Defense Force of Ethiopia uh, are reporting that they are controlling, capturing, taking away uh, different locations from the Tigray Regional State Special Forces uh, and airport is, air, airports and others are also uh, falling under the arms of the Ethiopian National Defense uh, Forces of Victory seems to be coming uh, from uh, uh, that part of the region to the uh, National uh, Forces according to the government sources. Uh, TPLF is saying that it is still uh, in control of most of the strategic locations uh, there but uh, TPLF is also facing condemnations uh, because of the attack it has staged on Eritrea 
uh, three rockets were fired uh, to Asmara and two of them have uh, hit uh, their target uh, this time around the Asmara uh, airport itself. The United States, uh, through its uh, top uh, diplomat Tibor Naj, uh, has strongly condemned this and they called it to if it's trying to internationalize uh, the fighting that's happening inside Ethiopia uh, by attacking uh, Asmara and they're calling for a de-escalation of the situation uh, and also protection for uh, civilians. So the war has continued. Uh, we should be able to report more um, as uh, 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 we are going to get more information perhaps in the coming uh, few hours. Luke 21:25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ his nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. A coup disguised as an impeachment. That's how thousands of Martin Vizcarra supporters are describing the political turmoil in Peru as the nation's interim president, Manuel Marino, also steps down after less than one week on the job. It was a week marred by nonstop protests, which saw two demonstrators killed in the melee. After less than a week in office, Peru's interim president, Manuel Marino, has stepped down. I want to make it known to the entire nation that I present my irrevocable resignation as president of the republic. I call for peace and unity of all Peruvians. Protests, which have been going on for months, hit new heights when Marino came to power last week after impeaching his popular predecessor, Martin Vizcarra. Vizcarra is accused of bribery and mismanaging the country's response to the coronavirus. He imposed one of the world's longest and strictest lockdowns in mid-March, a move many say devastated the nation's economy while the death toll continued to surge. As for the interim president, Manuel Merino, he has stated that Congress acted within the law in making him chief of state. However, protesters say the move by legislators was nothing less than a parliamentary coup. I am protesting against the institutions that allowed Marino to assume the presidency. He is not our president. Peruvian authorities harshly clamped down on protesters who opposed the government's actions. Accusations of police brutality during rallies are widespread, and there are reports that 40 people have gone missing since the latest round of demonstrations began. The violent actions of security forces spurred prominent Peruvians in government and the business community to demand that Marino step down. The politician did just that after a day of unrest in which two young protesters were killed and half of his cabinet resigned. Mr. Medino cannot stay one more minute in the government palace after what he has done to the Peruvian people. I urge Congress of the Republic that today we fix this constitutional crisis. While Peruvians cheered the decision on the streets, the country's leaders are preparing for what comes next. Congress called an emergency session on Sunday to find a replacement for Marino. Many view this as the worst political crisis for the nation in two decades. And some analysts say the situation has put Peru's fragile democracy into a precarious position. Parliamentary and presidential elections are scheduled for April. And hopes are a newly selected interim president can hold things together until then. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.